Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to our worship service on this, the second Sunday after Pentecost. And that's how we'll start marking the Sundays now. How long has it been since Pentecost? In this Pentecost season, we used to call it the Trinity season. Not a bad thing to call it either thing, because we do talk about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all the way through it. This part of the church here, we especially talk about our response to it and the application to our lives. We're starting a new series this morning from the book of Romans. We'll start in the heart and soul of the gospel, which is from Romans chapter 3. So the subject that we're really gathering around this morning is a word called atonement. And we'll talk about that more as we go forward. Let's begin with the first hymn, hymn 385, Chief of Sinners Though I Be. To find the order of service in your bulletin, please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. 
For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He gave us his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. O oh God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful, and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Today our first reading is from the fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning at verse 18. How important is it that we pass on this legacy of faith? You can't believe for your children or for your grandchildren, but you can certainly pass on the truth. Moses makes that point how important it is that we teach our children the truths of God's Word. Whether we have a Lutheran elementary school, or we homeschool, or we teach our children at home around the supper table. Wherever that happens, God says, tell them the truth. From Deuteronomy chapter 11. Put these words of mine in your hearts and in your soul, and tie them on your wrists as signs and symbols on your forehead. Teach them to your children by talking about them when you sit in your house and when you travel on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many on the land that the Lord promised to your fathers with an oath, as many as the days that the heavens remain over the earth. You see, I am placing before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. Or the curse if you do not listen to the commands of the Lord your God and you turn away from the path that I am commanding you today by walking after other gods whom you did not know. This is the word of God. Our second lesson and also the sermon text for today comes from the book of Romans in chapter 3. But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. This is God's word. The verse of the day is from Psalm 119. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. Today's gospel is recorded in the, in the seventh chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, beginning at verse 15. Glory be to you, O Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. In our Lord's words, he says, watch out for false prophets. And then he talks about the fruit. By their fruit, you will recognize them. You know, one of the problems we may have with those who don't bring the fruit is that, or that, that don't bring the truth, is that outwardly they seem to live lives in compliance with God's word. So what is the fruit Jesus is talking about? Well, what's the fruit of a prophet? It's what they preach, isn't it? And so Jesus said, listen to that, compare it to my word. Our Lord says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. You do not gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, do you? So then every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on bedrock. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. But it did not fall because it was founded on bedrock. Everyone who hears these words of mine but does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. It was completely destroyed. When Jesus finished speaking these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority and not like their experts in the law. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's continue with hymn 376. Especially for our viewers at home, I've been putting in the children's lesson back into the service, and a couple have said, my kids are waiting for this. And uh, for us who are big children, it never hurts, does it? I even had a member tell me many years ago, Pastor, no offense, I get more out of your children's lesson. So I totally get it. You know, it's an interesting thing that we should have the baptismal font that we do with the cover that it has. And I really want to talk about this cover. We know that what God promises in us in baptism, he calls it a washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Uh, God's word says in Titus that 
Baptism now saves you, not washing dirt from the body. It's not an outward sign, but the cleansing of our souls. God says this is like what he did when he destroyed sin and sinful people through the flood. Back when Noah was alive, but he preserved eight people in all through the ark. I want to talk about a different ark today too as I'm talking about the baptismal font. The Ark of the Covenant. Remember your Sunday school lesson? Boy, is it a whole lot smaller than I thought. When you read it, it's only about two feet long. It's only about 18 inches wide. It's only a couple of feet high. And so we're talking about a pretty small box. But inside that box, overlaid with gold, are the Ten Commandments and Aaron's staff and a jar of manna. And I'll talk more about that. What's important for our text today is the cover. On the cover, with those two winged angels that were on that, God said, I'm going to call that the atonement cover, or the atonement seat. And he said, there is my throne on earth. This is where I will, deal, uh, this is where I will dwell with my people. Listen in the sermon today for what God said, I want the priest to do with that atonement cover, because it's a picture of Jesus. In our text, Jesus is even called the atonement seat or the atonement cover. So isn't it appropriate that our baptismal font is covered with a cross to remind us that this is all under Christ, that this is his power that does this, that these things, and this is to whom we give thanks for all the blessings he's given us, especially that gift of faith. God's blessings to you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning is from Romans chapter 3. We read it earlier. I'll read it as we go through the text. Let's begin with prayer. O oh Lord, how thankful we are that we can be in your house today and we can worship you. And for those who aren't physically here, we're thankful for the technology that you've given us where we can gather around your word and hear the very words you, dear Holy Spirit, inspired. And now, Lord, let us receive those words in faith and set a guard over my mouth that I speak the truth and only the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of our precious Savior, my dear family in Christ, how good is good enough? You know, when it comes to professional athletics, that's quite a question, isn't it? Good enough has a whole lot more to do with the competition, usually, than the athlete him or herself. Now, I'll admit, if you're going to play in the NFL or the NBA or play Major League Baseball or some sort of Major League Soccer, men or women, you've got to be good. And I mean really, really good. Better than 99% of the people who try out. But every professional athlete knows there's going to come a time when someone, especially younger, comes along, younger, faster, stronger, amazing skills, and all of a sudden, good isn't enough anymore. You know, we're about a month from confirmation here at Our Savior. In those weeks and these weeks leading up to that great big Sunday, I'm reviewing what God's Word has taught our students, and they're, they're giving it back to me so I understand whether they understand it or not. And there's one question we've been working on for the last couple of weeks that they have to get right. How good is good enough? In a couple of questions, I've asked them the question, how well does God expect us to keep his commandments? And I've given them three choices of an answer. One, God knows we can't keep the commandments, so he really doesn't expect us to keep them at all. Number two, God expects us to do our best. And number three, God expects perfection of me. So which one is it? You know, let me go through those because it's interesting. I have had students answer, usually not the last one, interestingly enough, but they've they all will fall for number one at some point in their career as a confirmation student. And I meant it to be tricky. I wanted them to, fill out to, to learn what it meant to read critically what's there and to be able to apply God's word to it. God knows that we cannot keep his commandments, so he doesn't expect us to keep them. Yeah, God knows us. He knows that we're going to fail. He knows that we are never going to live up to this. And so logic, or maybe just looking around at the world and seeing the way it works, says... Well, then, why even try? If you know they're not going to do it anyway, why to lay down a law? And we see that in our world around us, don't we? 
We say that in some parents who just won't discipline their children anymore because it doesn't do any good anyway. We see it on the news when cities won't stop looters and rioters and it won't do any good anyway, so why enforce a law that doesn't do any good? But that's not really the way our world works most of the time, is it? Do you suppose, for example, that the Arlington Police Department expects that the people who use the street out here are going to go 45 miles an hour or less? Expect. That sign says they do expect that. They have a right to expect 100% compliance with that law. But do you also believe that the Arlington Police Department and our, our city fathers and whatnot, our courts, understand that some people aren't going to obey the law? <laughs> I'm one on occasion. And that we maybe will go too fast or maybe somebody will drive recklessly. Our laws also anticipate that there will be those who choose not to abide by that law. And our system of fines and jail time show that. So even our city government expects a 100% compliance with those laws, but also understands that some people will break them. The law still expects everyone to obey the law. In that, God is no different. How about the answer to my question of what God expects of us? God expects us to do our best. Well, that falls apart even with our laws too, doesn't it? I tell the police officer, 46 is as well as I could do, or 56, let's say, is the best I could do, police officer, in 45. He, he, I don't think he's even going to laugh as he writes that ticket. Yeah, is that it breaks down in our laws as well because the law really separates people into two categories, doesn't it? Those who keep it, those who break it. Doesn't give any points for trying. Still, that last choice I gave my students, God expects perfection, that is a difficult pill to swallow. You know, a few ch students will get there, but that's a really difficult one. And why is that? Well, part of it is, isn't it, that with just a little bit of introspection, there isn't anybody in his right mind who can claim that I'm perfect. I know I'm not. You know you're not. People understand that part of us, we're not even close. Some of you know this story. I probably told it in a Bible class or two. Many years ago, uh, the, my in my vicar year, my pastor asked me to go and make calls on the shut-ins of the congregation, if you don't know what that is. Folks in nursing homes are too sick to come to church or could be in a rehabilitation center after surgery, whatever that is. I went out and made 42 calls. And of the 42 people that I went and visited, I asked them the question basically, why should God let you into heaven? 38 of them told me, I'm good. I'm good enough. And then they went on to tell me that, you know, back in the day before this happened to me, I was in church every Sunday. I was a good giver, vicar. I also, I was always faithful to my spouse. I was a wonderful employer or employee. Oh, sure, not perfect, but yeah, I did my best. Hmm. And so I asked them, because I'm getting these I'm good enough answers, how good do you have to be to be with God in his heaven? And that's when the truth dawned. I'm talking to Christians here who are giving me back the wrong answers, but probably know the right answer. And they did, because all of them would look at me and said, oh, now I hear the question a whole lot differently. How good do you have to be with God in heaven? You have to be perfect, vicar. Yeah, and none of them claimed to be perfect. What about the other four people of those 42 that gave me a different answer? The one I will never forget is I phrased the question to one elderly lady. I said, if Jesus were standing here and said, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? She said, you. And I knew she didn't mean me. <laughs> so I said, what? And she said, Jesus. Well, it pretty much said it all, didn't it? What a sweet and wonderful answer that was. You know, just before our text, in this same chapter of Romans, God the Holy Spirit moved the Apostle Paul to write, now we know that whatever the law says is addressed to those under the law, so that every mouth will be silenced and the whole world will be subject to God's judgment. For this reason, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law. For through the law, we become aware or conscious of sin. You are under the law. If you're a human being, you're under the law. God placed all mankind under his law, and we're under his law whether we know that law or whether we like it or not. God holds the whole world accountable. He gave his law to just tell everybody, you have nothing to say in my courtroom. You're guilty. That includes you. It includes me. And there is a part of every human being that wants to argue this one. I am not that bad. 
I have never cheated on my spouse. I've never robbed a store. I've never killed anyone. And I've certainly never bowed down to any other God. Oh, really? Because that whole argument says, I am bowing down to another God, isn't it? It's the one we talked about in Monday Night Bible Study not long ago. The number one God worshipped in the world is self. Yeah, Paige is the one who gave me the answer, and we said, well, it wasn't Paige. But it was self is the answer that everybody worships in that. Because I think I'm right. And I can't possibly be as bad as those other people. So I try to say to you, I've never cheated on my spouse. You know what God's word says? Have you ever, and I mean ever, had a lustful thought? Jesus says to look and to lust is to break the commandment. That's not all, though. When I teach my, my children, my confirmation students about this, there's another side to that commandment that says, if you have not done everything you could to make your marriage the best it can be all the time, you have broken that commandment. Wow. Now we're not even getting into the cheating part at all. We're just getting into falling short on that. Jesus also said that you don't have to kill someone to break that commandment. How about hate? Or Remember how the rest of that explanation goes. If I have not helped and been a friend to someone, I have broken the commandment. How many times? I mean, we go over these things and say, wow, all the rest of these commandments. How about I've never robbed a store, but God tells us that if we have not worked with all our might as an employee, given the best effort we can all the time, then we've stolen from our employer. Or if as an employer that we haven't given fair wages, but go beyond that. If I have not entreated my employees as people and loved them and cared for them, then I have fallen short on this commandment. There is a reason that we begin the confession. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. Remember how we used to start that in the old hymnal, what I call the old hymnal now? I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all the sins with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your or thy temporal and eternal punishment. When we see ourselves as God sees us under his law, we cry out with the Apostle Paul those words, what a wretched, miserable wretch I am. Who will save me from this body of death? You know the answer to that question, don't you? And that's where this text is going, and it is such a sweet answer, because the answer is, is the one that that elderly lady gave me all those years ago. You, Jesus. Oh, but there's such sweetness in what she said and in what's behind that in our text. Romans 3, 21 to the first part of verse 25. But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. There is no difference. All have fallen short of God's glory. We've all lost his image. We have all fallen short of his approval. None has lived up to his standard. And God judges all people by the same standard. 100% compliance with his law. Righteousness means to be right. To be perfect. To be holy. This is no competition to see who we can take that will make the cut to be just good enough to get into God's kingdom. This is everything or nothing. This is perfection or damnation. It was that way in Old Testament times. It is still that way. But our text begins, but now. Oh, I don't know if there's any more beautiful words than those first two that introduce this text. But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. There is a righteousness. There is a holiness. There is a verdict that says, welcome to heaven, because you have a place here that is available from our God, and it comes through Jesus Christ to all who believe. This is the heart and soul of the gospel. This is the reason that God the Holy Spirit inspired these things to be written in New Testament and Old Testament, because Jesus is your Savior is the banner over the Old Testament as well as the New. 
Paul, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, says that this was revealed to us in the law and the prophets. In Moses and in the whole rest of the Old Testament, it was there all the time. Because all the people in the Old Testament were lost and condemned sinners, and all those who were rescued were rescued in the same way that you were, by grace, through faith, and for them, in the coming Messiah, in God's promise, you and the Messiah that came, the God-man Jesus Christ who took your place at the cross and saved you. You know, God inspired his Old Testament prophet Jeremiah to talk about that Savior who would come, who would give us the verdict of not guilty in God's courtroom. Jeremiah wrote in the 23rd chapter of his book, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is right in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Jesus is that righteous branch that comes from the family tree of King David. He's the one who always did what was right. He is the one who actually is good and good enough. He kept all of God's commandments, even in his thoughts, which is amazing. He is righteous, he is holy, and now he has become your righteousness. Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. That's what we sang. Not, not my righteousness, Lord. It is your righteousness that is mine. At the cross, Jesus took your sins and mine. He took our sins and he became our sin in that moment. And God cursed that sin. He sent that to hell. Jesus suffered the hell that every one of our sins deserved. And then because Jesus accomplished that, when he rose from the dead, that was our Father's declaration and his righteousness has become yours. Now I see you covered in Jesus Christ. And all of that forgiveness, all of that righteousness that you have been, you have been redeemed freely by his grace, it cost you nothing. It cost Jesus dearly, didn't it? He shed his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Now there's a phrase I left out of this text. I've done all the other phrases that are here except for the last couple of verses. And the phrase I left out is, I think, the most beautiful picture of it all. Because those words say, whom, referring to Jesus, God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. Can you imagine what a profound truth that was to Jewish Christians who knew their Old Testament like Paul did? That's a picture on the great day of atonement. You could not go but into the Holy of Holies just because you decided you wanted to look in there. The high priest could only go, he could only go once a year. And God said, first, he has to take a bull and sacrifice for his own sins. And then he has two goats. One he will select to sacrifice for the sins of the people. The other is the scapegoat. They put their hands on it. The elders of Israel do. Confess Israel's sins. And he's led out into the desert. That's where that term comes from. The scapegoat. He carries the sins away symbolically in that sense. But the one who sacrificed. Now the high priest will go in twice into the Holy of Holies on that day. Once with the blood of the bull. Once with the blood of the ram. And he is instructed first to sprinkle the blood on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. On the mercy seat, it's also called. On the atonement seat. And then in front of it as well. He is to do that because of what that atonement seat means. But I want you to think about, them, uh, about the high priest sprinkling the blood on the atonement seat cover. On the Ark of the Covenant, what's in there? What's in there? Ten Commandments, the original Ten Commandments that God engraved with his own finger. What's in there is Aaron's staff that miraculously budded as if it were still attached to the tree. And in there is a jar of manna, that miraculous bread that God sent down from heaven. Can you hear echoes? This is what got me as I was preparing this. Echoes of some of the things that Jesus talked about in his ministry. He said, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. He who eats of this bread will live forever. It's interesting that the manna should be in the Ark of the Covenant. How about the, that staff that miraculously budded? Our Lord said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bud and you will bear fruit, which is to live a Christian life. And then the commandments. Of course, Jesus kept them perfectly. Perfection is necessary for heaven. And so go back to the atonement seat, to the atonement cover. Every year on that great day, the blood is sprinkled on that, 
But God also called it not only the mercy seat and the atonement cover. He says, that's the footstool of my throne. That gave Israel that wonderful picture of the throne room of God in heaven, reaching all the way down to earth at the atonement cover and says, this is where I will be with people. God declared his people not guilty of their sins when that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, not because of the blood of a bunch of dead animals, but because of what that blood meant. The book of Hebrews clears up that mystery for us. It's written there. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. So what's the blood on the atonement seat? It's the blood Christ shed on the cross, isn't it? That's what it was in picture form in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, that's why Christ is called the atonement seat. His blood shed for you. And it even says that God put him on public display as the atonement seat. Who was Jesus on public display? In blood? Well, that's easy, isn't it? At the cross. Right there at one of the main gates of the city where everybody saw him and covered in his own blood that he shed for you and for all for the sin of the world. And there when he said to Telestai, it is finished. He made the sacrifice, I'm going to use a fancy word, propitiation, which means that he satisfied our debt with God. He appeased God. He took away all the anger, righteous anger, that God had against sin and every sinner, and he made atonement. When I teach this to my conf conf uh, try it again, confirmation students, I wipe off those last four letters, meant, and you're left with atone. And then I put a big line between the T and the O and tell them, read those two words. At one. That's what atonement means. It means we had a broken relationship with God because of our sins. He said, these are loami in the Old Testament. These are not my people. And now he has said to you, you are the people of God. Sons and daughters of the King. You have been made children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, has indeed purified you from all sin. Now we can say with the Lord's apostle, with great relief and with great joy, those words of verses 27 and 28. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. Oh, how we thank God for the gift of faith that he miraculously worked in our hearts through the gospel and word and sacrament. And through that faith, God has covered you with the blood of Jesus Christ. He has become your atonement seat, made you at one with God. And that's more than good enough. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's join in prayer. You'll find the prayer of the church in your bulletin this morning, and I invite you to respond with that which is in bold type. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Make our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy the, your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. 
where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. And now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition silently. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. We pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's remain standing for Rock of Ages, hymn 389. Please be seated. God's blessings go with you.